My name is Maura O'Neill, and uh, I uh, am an entrepreneur by background, but uh, spent uh, five years in the U.S. government, one as a chief of staff for a U.S. senator in 2008 during the financial meltdown, and then the first chief innovation officer for USAID. So I'm delighted um, to be here at uh, the Skull Forum community. We know that nothing ever nothing important ever happens without courageous people taking a leap of faith and i'm delighted to be hanging out with these three individuals today who have who had successful careers in law in not-for-profits and technology and in epidemiology and then decided uh, to put those aside for some portion of time or alongside what they were doing and join the government or be an advisor to the government. And so as I was thinking about this panel, and we're going to um, uh, start with uh, Mayor Guerrero, right? I'm trying to roll my R's. I'm not very good at it. So, um, and uh, he's from Cali, uh, Colombia. And I was thinking about uh, what you were up against when you decided uh, to become mayor. So I remember back when I started my career, I was working on trying to get electric utilities to um, be more energy efficient and get women to have more opportunities. And I was having a particularly bad day and a particularly bad week. So I called my friend, because that's what we do to cry on our shoulders. And instead of that, she said to me, uh, Mara, have you been put in prison for this yet? And I said, no. She says, have they tried to assassinate you? And I said, well, that would be a no. So she says, sort of, what's your belly aching? I mean, if you look at history, you know, the price that social innovators have played is enormous. So I thought of that story because um, you decided not once but twice uh, to become a mayor of a city where you had 15 times the uh, homicide rate of the global average of countries in the world. So while I could have this conversation in theory with one of my best friends, this was actually something that was very real. And in fact, your kids, some of your kids weren't so excited about uh, you deciding to sort of go oh, round two oh, with this, my right? My wife wasn't either. And your wife says, like, you have a nice <laughs> life, right? So tell us what made you decide to to do this courageous thing given the fact that the threat of actually being killed was ever present and perhaps maybe even as present today to to take on the kind of change you were looking at well first of all let me introduce myself i, I i've been a physician public health academic person working spending most of my life university environment and back in 1992 that was the peak of the Cali cartel the there was the possibility that uh, the one to be elected was one person chosen or by the drug barons of Cali and since I was very well known I have worked in the slums of with poor people and work in the state university people say, well, why don't you try do us the favor of running for mayor, which I did on an independent ballot and I was elected. Uh, to tell you the truth, up until now, the, the fact of being assassinated had never gone over my mind. So I, you just put it out of your mind? I, you just, it, it, it might be there, but it doesn't, I've never been worried about it. <laughs> I know you have to die sometime in life, so the later the better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'll that tell you something. When he, after he left, uh, when they <laughs> actually uh, took the, the leaders of the Cali cartel and they analyzed their computers, they found out that the head of security, Rodrigo's head of security, was in yeah. the payroll of the cartel. And the, oh. and, oh. And the police. So his, so his <laughs> security detail was actually on the payroll of the cartel. Right. It sort of doesn't get closer. Yeah. Okay. But the, the police commander and the chief of narcotics control was also on the payroll of the, of the drug cartels. This is to me that the city was permeated, the police was permeated by that. But then, yeah. putting that apart, when I, I knew 
homicides were deferred cause of death for the general population, which is very unusual. Even in countries in conflict, you seldom see that the mo most frequent cause of death was homicide. And nobody knew what to do. Some people say that we Colombians were genetically violent, which I don't know, we Ecuadorians uh, were uh, genetically the same and they are not as violent as we are. As, uh, some other people say it was poverty and they say well, Haiti is a much more poor country than us and it's con the homicide rates are considerably lower. So I did what we, I, I am trained as an epidemiologist, which is a branch of public health that deals with causes of disease. I did what, what we do when facing a disease of a known origin. And I will go over briefly on that. The only, the, the reason is, uh, the, the, the merit that I might have is using it for a social cause, has been using chronic diseases. In this country, the example of uh, Bradford Hill when they discovered the association of tobacco smoking and lung cancer a classic epidemiological study, and then many other. But I applied to a social disease like homicide. So that was, let me see. So you thought about violence in the same way you think about disease. Right, absolutely. I follow yeah. this. So, well, this is something that is important, measures, and I, we tend to be very practical. In, in Colombia, we were the first city to record data, so we had a, 127 per 100,000 homicide rate. So when that was published, people said, well, of course, you Cali people, the Cali cartel. I went to Medellin, and they had the Medellin cartel, and the homicide rate was 400 per 100,000, three times as high as the Cali were. Bogota, which was a peaceful, we say, like a convent, was 80, which is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, homicide rate, so it was a pandemic. What the whole and, let, and let me just put it in perspective, because globally it's about six. So it gives you <laughs> some sense of what this number is of 80 or 100 six, or... Six, six, per, six the Latin America is the region with higher homicide rate, will be around 12 to 15 yeah. nowadays. At those days, I had 126, 400, and um, even Bogota had 80. So we were really in, in the middle of that. So we did, we, we were the, the first one to, to notice it. Yeah. It was not the central government. We went to, and then we went to the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, and we got the first time that they made a loan to cities for the prevention of violence. So we were really feeling the, the problem. Then, just to give you the, the this shows the importance. Uh, the dark red shows the total 25.5 million years lost uh, to external, uh, to injuries per year. 20.5 million years, so it was really impressive. It, this is a different way of expressing the same homicide rate, but in, 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 a, in, a, in a more uh, easy to understand. Yes, so lost life. L lost life. Yeah. Then, most important, violence, was not a simple issue, so a, si a, pheno a complex phenomenon cannot be solved with a simple solution. Most people say, get more police, get, put them out to the streets, whatever. So it was, a, there were several factors that we put together there, like alcohol consumption, firearms, cultural, which in Colombian cases, dramatic, Eff ineffective police, organized crime, inequity, not poverty. Empirically, it has been shown that it's the coexistence of the two extremes. Countries that are uniformly poor do not, are not violent. Those were the most inequity. So, so with all this, this was a complex thing. So what, what we did, what we epidemiologists do, next. Define, St. Augustine said, define and you shall not discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Violence <laughs> meant anything could be psychological violence, by, uh, political violence, economic violence. We said, but we need, we, you adopt a de the definition of WHO, that disease, where, whom, where, and where is taking place. Try to understand it, make a hypothesis, make a plan, evaluate, reformulate. 
very simple. This is Aristotle described it, the Greek philosophers already have described it. The observe, induce a general law, and then from that law, deduce and check whether this is true. This is the scientific method that we know it. Then we define this violence for our purposes with the use of physical force with the intention of causing injury or death. The two elements is force and intentionality. That excludes accidents, it excludes psychological violence, other forms of violence which are extremely important. But the, those are the ones that end up in a homicide or an injury. So this was our definition. So for our purpose then, with that definition, we went out to see where was taking that place. And you see this uh, homicides in Cali. They tend to cluster in the poorer areas of the city. And they still are. This, this, this is some years old. And way up in the, in the mountainside. So these are oh. along the riverside. Yeah. Then we noticed that they tended to occur on weekends, yeah. which was kind of weird because we, oh. our prejudice was that homicides were related to uh, the drug environments. So why, why do they wait until the weekends to settle their things? So we began to think there might be some other factors. Then we, we, we measure anything that happens in weekends in Colombia. We, the first automatic response is related to alcohol. So we measure blood alcohol levels of those being killed. And you see almost 50% were legally intoxicated. They have more than 0.5 milligrams per hundred cc. So, so why the drug barons wait for weekends and intoxicate their people? We began to think, who else were young people, male, from poor areas? So that was the complex description. So we said, what can we do with that? Then, well, almost 80% were with firearms. So there were the most important findings, so what we did, we proposed restricting alcohol sales in public spaces until 2 a.m. on weekdays, forbidding the carrying firearms, which in Colombia is very difficult because they are manufactured and authorized by the Army. Our NRA is the, is the Army, but nonetheless, we obtain permission to forbid in certain areas, in certain given dates, and the plants got, once you implant whatever you want, evaluate. So we did a careful evaluation, has been published in the American Journal of Epidemiology. And when we compare those weekends in which we have banned carrying firearms and restriction of alcohol selling times, the, the reduction in homicide was 35% with only firearms, but 14%. So that was an important reduction. So uh, up until now, we were absolutely empirical. We were not thinking what is going on, why. Simply doing those things, you, you were able to reduce the homicide rate. So let me ask you a question. Um, you know, because in the U.S., if you were to, or in a lot of countries, if you were to say, okay, we know the solution is there's too many guns, or we need to restrict the times or, or the backgrounds of it. Uh, we struggle desperately with getting that passed. How did you actually get these restrictions passed? It was very difficult. It goes against the Colombian culture. Culture, yeah. Drinking is part of life. Uh, part of life and death, <laughs> <laughs> as, it's, as we found. But it, I did, uh, th there was a big uproar in, in the city, so I invited <coughs> the owners of these night places. Yeah. And I say, look, I'm going to put s restriction selling of alcohol. If nothing happens, as you believe, in, in three months time, I will join you drinking 24 hours. If, if there is a reduction, as I expect, I will keep it. In two weeks time, it was dramatic. The reduction in injuries and killings in the city were dramatic. So wow. I called them back and say, look, Sorry, 
till the last day of my mandate, you will, uh, we will keep them closed. So it was kind of experimental yeah. to study, but very. It sort of reminds me when Nandan and Nilan Kani from India uh, was trying to get the national ID. He said, uh, you know, they were all, politicians were all opposed to it. And he says, well, I just want to do a pilot, just 100 million people. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is very interesting to come up against this right. by saying, we're just going to do a pilot. If in a couple weeks this doesn't make a difference, it's Go back to drinking 24 it, hours a day. This is not a prejudice. I told them I love alcohol. I, I drink. <laughs> no, it's not a problem. I am not a teetotaler. Yeah. I, 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 I can drink. I know. But everywhere it has been shown to be a risk for, to, yeah. for homicide. Then this is what happened in Colombia. You see, this is, was Medellin. This purple red. That was the time of Pablo Escobar, the, the pistol plan, they will, he will pay two million pesos for each policeman killed. So they were killing. And then it went down dramatically because there was a pack on the... The, the FARC, right. Mm -hmm. they, they said, okay, just don't get killed. Yeah. Then one of them was extradited to the U.S. and then the pack was broken and this, the thing went up and then had been going down. Bogota, which is the blue line, I steadily used the method. Yeah. Cali, we began. The measures that follow me say those unpopular things like closing my places at 2 a.m. or c counting bodies, dead bodies, and publishing data. No way. They abandoned this. So when I entered two, three years ago, it was 90%. It had gone down from 126 to 90. Now it's 62, and this year, this yesterday got the first trimester the homicide numbers, not rates, have been the lowest in the last 15 years. So the trend is going down. And you've done this all in just really two or three years, right? Right, right. That's amazing. That's so, amazing. But then, okay, the secret. We discovered that police had different ways of measuring data. They counted dead bodies in the street as homicides. Uh, they do not, did not count those that were, they died in the hospital. Forensic medicine people, on the contrary, counted anyone dying in Cali, regardless of the origin of the injury. But many people come to Cali because of health services, so, we had, so there was no way knowing which was the real truth. So we began to do a weekly meeting that we call, uh, which forensic medicine, the, the judiciary system, the police, an academic unit meet regularly. For the last 20 years, every Tuesday, they go on case by case. Was it this an accident? Is it this? And they come out with a official data that uh, defines clearly what has happened. Yeah. This strategy became, we, we call it observatories of crime. And this is one of the, probably the only innovation of the whole story because this is an old method. Is, is being applied in 25 cities of Colombia and many other countries in the region because the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank have been uh, said, recommending that yeah. set up these groups to study what really, to get reliable information. Then, these are the names of the countries where it's it, is it. Then, this is an, uh, another spin-off. I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time. But, when we began to go from one country to the other, you can see Honduras. Honduras, in the year, according to UNDP, in 2004, had 65 per 100,000. And according to the OAS, it was 33.6. So the data was very different. Absolutely. And the yeah. same for our country. Yeah. So we began a project that is going on beautifully, yeah. defining each Homicide, what is a homicide? How do you recollect the information? What are the difficulties? And we have 18 indicators of violence, crime, theft, robbery, extortion, defined, and people are adopting it. So we are beginning to have comparable results. And think, well, this, are, this is the project. We have all these institutions working, yeah. but this is the final end. This method that I described, observe, where, who, when, make, a, make a, a hypothesis, test it, and go back 
could be traced to a professor, an Oxford professor, Roger Bacon, mm -hmm. which in the 13th century, he was a Franciscan friar. He translated the Greek philosophers. He translated Aristotle. And he began to uh, say, the way to acquire knowledge is by observation. He had a big discussion with the Dominican fathers, Aquinas, mm -hmm and Alberto Magno, which were rather to think that you, by deduction, you, you could make uh, knowledge. The, this Francis friar and said, observe. And then he says, he dis described the, uh, the, this, the el, el placebo effect. And then he said, why do we have to explain as a miracle something that can be explained on a natural basis. At that time, it was a big heresy. He was supported by a pope that died. The moment that pope died, he was put in prison for 15 years. Yeah. But, he, he, but he, in, 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 all, in all truth, he was a Franciscan friar, professor of Oxford, controversial, as I, I understand all Oxford professors are. Uh, the, 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 the so 800 years <laughs> later, you took this methodology <laughs> and made, in two or three years, a dramatic difference in Absolutely. violence. And it seems to me that this same kind so of methodology it, it, could really apply to other social problems uh, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then, final comment. Some of you might have read a novel by the Italian Umberto Eco, The Name of the Rose. Well, if you have read it, read, read it. Is the discussion between the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And the f also, also, he was a Franciscan. He said, yeah. observe the, 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 the path of the, of the yeah. horses and make the right. document from, from that. That was the discussion that took place at that time. Right. So, that, Thank uh, you. Sorry, sorry for Thank the, you for very the much. <laughs> uh, so we're going to um, move a little closer to home. Uh, Diana uh, Good, uh, was a very distinguished uh, uh, litigator, regulatory lawyer uh, for many years. And then um, the UK decided uh, in their aid agency, DFID, uh, who their budget's about 11, million, 11 billion pounds a year, it right? almost that now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and they thought perhaps that they ought to create an independent commission. Um, for uh, taking a look at all of that. So I want you to tell us a little bit about why you decided to leave this prosperous, interesting, engaging career and go do this. But before um, you do that, I want you to talk about a conversation we had just a few minutes ago. And that is, um, when you were starting out in your career and you were aspiring to be the most successful uh, um, lawyer that you could be or um, uh, one of the big people in the firm brought you aside and said uh, Diana if you want to get ahead don't make waves <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and that was it seems to me this moment um, for you so tell us what happened then and then we can segue to diffid and aid and because okay. I think everybody in this room has those moments in their career. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I have to say, I mean, I was grateful to be allowed to be a lawyer at all. There were hardly any women in the law when I applied. And I was told uh, by my firm that they just recently decided to take on, have a quota. And they, one in seven of the people they were taking on was going to be a woman. So this <laughs> meant, I think, that two of us were women in my <laughs> intake. And we were a very odd species altogether, so far as the firm and the clients were concerned. And one of the very first things that happened when I was, uh, well, this is when I was newly qualified, uh, was there was, uh, I was sent off to see a client, and the first thing that happened was there was a complaint about me, which went straight to the senior partner. And the first I knew about it was the next morning I turned up at work and the senior partner was in my room saying, Diana, there's been a complaint about you. And I thought, this is the end of everything. All these and years, all here. these years <laughs> I've studied and tried and now already. And the complaint was that I was a woman. That was the only complaint. And what was my firm doing sending a woman along? And the senior partner who uh, I hadn't met at that point uh, was fantastic. And he said, Dan, I've done a bit of research about you. 
And I've told the clients, Diana Good is good. And if you don't want Diana, you don't get linked laters. And I thought, this is a firm I could stay with and work for. Yeah. It was I mean, it was impressive, actually, yeah. in those days. Um, however, once I got a my courage up a little bit, I did start to be myself a bit more, <laughs> which means saying things. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking truth to power, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was advised, don't make waves. And I remember going to the toilet, and actually it was quite difficult to find a toilet in the firm in those days if you were a woman, because there weren't very many facilities for women. Um, and I went to the toilet, and I locked myself in the toilet, and I did cry, and I just thought, I, I really don't know how I'm going to do this job, because obviously I can't be myself. My father had advised me when I went for the interview that I should go dressed as much as a man, like a man as I could which was difficult because you weren't allowed to wear trousers in those days. And, and uh, so, I mean, this is a theme. And I thought, if I can't be myself, I can't do the job. But I can't do the job if I'm not my, I can't not be myself. And in that toilet, I cried. And I, and I thought, well, it's no good. I just have to be myself. And if that doesn't work, I'll go and do something else. And... Um, and I guess it did work. I mean, I certainly uh, had a success in the firm. I became a very senior partner. I was uh, lucky. Um, but I worked in a world of a lot of, um, there, was, there always was, and there still is issue for women. Um, 20 years ago in the firm, 17% of the partners were women. That had been an enormous growth from there hardly being any women in the, in the firm at all uh, when I joined. Um, and no partners. Oh, absolutely. Um, there were the, the first partner was made a partner in 1980, our first woman partner. Um, and by 1995, 17% of the partners were women. Today, 17% of the partners are women. So there has not been progress. And this is, you know, this is not unusual. Um, but it's also a world in which, I mean, our, all our clients were multinational corporations. I'm coming to your, your, the, the other part yeah. of your question. The multinational corporations, multinational banks, these are outfits that exude enormous power. We're not talking about the threat of being assassinated. <laughs> but I did deal, I mean, I was a litigator and regulatory investigation lawyer, and we did uh, a lot of cartel we did a lot work. Of fraud, uh, a lot of fraud cartel fraud. work, a lot of fraud yeah. work, a lot of insider dealing. And I was dealing with chief executives and very senior people who were very worried, yeah. uh, indeed, uh, about the franchise and about the reputation of the firm as a whole. And you know, the eyes of the world's regulatory <coughs> uh, investigators would be upon them. And I can remember going to a meeting in Canary Wharf uh, with the chief executive of a very major bank um, who exuded so much power, he always traveled uh, with at least six security guards. This in Canary Wharf, to walk across the square um, <laughs> in London. Um, six security guards bristling with guns. And you know, this, this was a demonstration of power. So these are the sort of clients I, I, I dealt with. Um, and you know, you'd be one woman in a room or on a conference call of 40 uh, very testosterone-driven men. Right. Um, but I always reckon that my job was to be a trusted advisor and to stick to integrity and independence and actually tell the most senior people in organizations the things that other people below absolutely didn't dare tell them. Yeah. And, you know, you have, to, you have to screw yourself up and it can be incredibly difficult to do that um, in a world where your job and your reputation depends on the way you work. But I'd done it for 30 years, and it was a good job, and I was lucky I was good at it. I was also a criminal, part-time criminal judge for 11 years, and I've sent quite a lot of people to prison for um, being parts of drug gangs and so on. Um, uh, but and you didn't, then you decided to but, make but, a change. But then I, I it, suddenly, one day I was bored. Suddenly, I didn't have the adrenaline any longer. I went to a major meeting, major subprime huge problem it's going to be litigation for years and years and years and I just thought it's no good I'm bored I cannot keep defending what I felt was somewhat the indefensible and I thought I've got energy and oomph and I, I have to do something else well Linklaters was already doing quite a lot of um, pro, a lot of pro bono work and starting doing global pro bono work and we started a partnership with CAMFED 
and CAMFED asked us to do a review of their governance model. Um, and we said, well, you know, we're international litigators. We deal with corporate governance models, not, not, not international development. And they said, bring your completely different set of um, knowledge and skills of different sectors to bear on this sector. And we, we published a report called Accounting to the Girl, which was uh, launched here at the Skull uh, World Forum five years ago at the plenary, opening plenary session. And, um, and that led me on in due course to uh, apply to the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, which is the UK aid watchdog, which yes. is, a, I, I do believe, um, uh, a pretty unique um, uh, institution. We're completely independent of government. We report direct to parliament. We publish all our reports. So we review whether UK government international aid expenditure is being effective and mm -hmm. having the impact it's meant to have and, and, and maximizing that impact. And we uh, publish our reports. We've published 40 of them in four years. And um, uh, the government responds to our recommendations. And then we do follow ups to see whether you know, what we've recommended has happened. Who, who, who appoints that commission? And who That's pays a very it? good question. And who, who pays for it? It is paid out of um, a DFID's budget, and um, uh, the, uh, ultimately the Secretary of State uh, chooses who the commissioners should be. Um, and that's the person who heads DFID, for those who don't understand. Yeah, the Secretary that, of State for yeah. International Development who heads DFID. So although we're a very independent-minded group of commissioners, there does remain a question. Uh, 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 you're right about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and indeed, the uh, Select Committee on Parliament uh, did recently question whether the selection procedure was as independent as it should be and whether there wasn't a risk that it could be said that um, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a favoured um, insider might get selected. Um, so, I mean, I come back to all my training as a lawyer um, and my earlier experience has, has taught me that against what can be quite um, challenging odds, I don't mean fear to my life, um, but actually sticking to the truth and sticking to your guns and sticking to your principles and being independent um, can be very challenging. And certainly, it's a sector which isn't used to th this level of challenge. Um, I'm not saying people don't question what they do. I'm not saying people aren't trying to do their best. There's a lot of evaluation, of course. But actually, I come from a world where everything is regulated, where everything is scrutinized, where massive negligence claims are brought against you if you don't do things right. This sector is not uh, burdened with that. Um, but but perhaps we don't have the benefit of it but, as much as we should either. But it, but it means that really that, that challenge, and certainly uh, I, I don't think that DFID necessarily enjoy us going in and doing uh, reviews, and obviously it can be very challenging. And we have a pretty blunt system we were invite, uh, asked to uh, operate, which is traffic light system. So we you know, either give it a red because it's really bad, or red amber, or that down to a green. Um, so it's pretty blunt and, and visible um, uh, ratings. But certainly our experiences, and I hear it time and time again uh, from people at DFID, that actually they really do appreciate the challenge. And it also enables, uh, in, in many respects, staff to elevate issues which it may be difficult for them to elevate upwards as well. Yeah, that's great. So here we have, I think, two excellent examples of people who took their incredible skills that they had developed not in government, um, and every one of you have that as well, and brought them in. So let's hop on a plane from uh, Heathrow and end up in the Middle East, so, uh, and end up in Palestine in particular. So um, our third panelist has, uh, operates in also a very challenging part of the world on a number of issues. And I think one of the things that has been so interesting about the role that you have played is that you were the Minister of Telecom um, a few years back uh, uh, for the head of Palestine and remain uh, a trusted advisor uh, today uh, as well. I hope so. Right? What? I hope so. I'm not yeah. sure if I'm a uh, yeah. trusted yeah. advisor. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sebra, we're really uh, thrilled to have you here. I know you have a one-minute video that you want us to see, and I'll just let uh, 
you tell us um, what have you found the most challenging part of, uh, of advise, either being in the government or advising the government in such a conflict-ridden part of the world? Well, uh, thank you, Maura. I'm still under the influence of comedy, so if you don't mind, I'll break the formalities <laughs> yes. and start with a joke, if that's yes, okay. Yes, yes, that sounds because good. Because I see the crowd, good. it's the session before last, and I could see that some are starting some to Some are yawn, waiting some for the jokes, right? Like me, <laughs> hiding the yawn, so I might as well tell you a joke about leaving government. Uh, one of my dear friends uh, had uh, told me the following joke. He said, what's the difference between a camel and a politician? And I said, what's that? He said, a camel can work 10 days without drinking. A politician can drink 10 days without working. <laughs> so I thought maybe it's time to leave politics and focus on something uh, really tangible. And uh, I admire you, Mr. Mayor. I admire Diana Gould uh, for what you have said about women. I, uh, I feel you, know, you have come a long way, certainly, determination and adamance. And here you have a man who has been worried about himself being assassinated. What about a people who have been worried about their identity being assassinated and their countryhood being assassinated and about their existence being assassinated, the Palestinians? And I thought maybe we can do something good in our life. If I tell you I come from the West Bank and Gaza, you immediately think of war, of uh, killing, of bloodshed. Yet, yes, we live misery, but we produce hope. And that's what we're good at, is that we are never surrendering to the situation and to the status quo. We always rebuild. I have seen speakers after speakers in numerous occasions, especially in the Skoll Forum, talking about starting something that's good. I tell you, this effect of starting is restarting all the time in Palestine. Because, you know, over the last four years of the inception of the organization I, worked, uh, for, I, I work for now, Net Kitabi, which is addressing uh, a very sensitive issue, education. And I say we in Palestine, while the war is at, uh, while the world is at each other's necks in terms of fighting over religion, we have one religion called education. And at Net Kitabi, we thought we might as well focus on children, look at an interactive education, turn the addiction of children into the addiction they have on electronic games into something constructive whereby we use educational games. So they learn physics and mathematics. And I'll show you in my video, a uh, one second, I said to my colleagues, we better rush. We don't want to make a boring video. Might as well show the audience as to how can you learn uh, geometry using electronic gaming? How can you learn chemistry? And you will see how you could uh, learn. And please don't be hesitant to order our computer uh, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Before we go to the video, if you don't mind, let me just say the following. I have been in Gaza lately, and I'm amazed as to how people uh, can come out of the rubble and express their readiness to restart life. And this is what I meant by the effect of restarting. Over the four years of the inception of the Net Kitabi project, there's been three wars on Gaza. You have seen the horror scenes over television, and you have been maybe visiting the Middle East and you know how it looks like. This effect of restarting, I often ask myself, why do I have to do it every time? You build a computer lab, it's bombed, you come back and you still want to do a computer lab, and it's the following, it's the people who drive you into wanting to do more and more things. When they say to you, we're ready to do business. Here is a mobile app. Here is a learning object, which is you know an animated scene that can consolidate education and build up knowledge in the Palestinian society. You can't surrender and say to them, no, I'm defeated. I'm killed with apathy. I'm not going to do work. In Gaza 10 days ago, I met two cases. One, well, I will leave it to the video to tell you about the cases. But the video starts off with some misery, two cases whom I've seen. But then the conclusion of the discussion I had with them was the following. What happened to our computers? We want computers. And people say to me, you know, how would computers ever liberate Palestine? When I spoke, and I was a minister 10 years ago now, when I spoke to the people of Palestine about e-government, somebody turned to me on a hospital bed in Gaza saying, you know, you're the one with e-government. What about e-bread? Can you get us bread? We want to eat. And I said, you know, 
do, have you heard of the, of the famous Chinese saying that don't teach, well, teach a man how to fish and not give him the fish. And we are in the business of hope. And this is what uh, really excites me. And when I hear your stories, I feel, you know, my story is a minute story. But yet it is the story for you to be proud of, that you see a Palestinian with no horns and tail, a Palestinian who's a human being coming to you, say, you know, enough with bloodshed. I want to liberate Palestine, but I want to do it with a computer. And I'm sure you'll be proud of a Palestinian who will be in the knowledge production business and not in misery. So I'm sorry the video will start with a bit of misery from Gaza, first hand, 10 days ago, but then builds on the experience and then we'll take it from there. So if you don't mind. You and I spoke on the phone, and uh, and so before I open it up to some more questions, I asked you um, what must be in the minds of everybody listening to this story, um, and that is, where do you find the inspiration um, every day to continue this work, continue in this region um, that you care so deeply about, um, because it's got to be so hard. So where do you get that inspiration? I would say the inspiration, with all honesty, comes from the people. Mm. I have uh, a TV show that runs every day. I tell people about social media and how to deal with social media. And I get phone calls from mothers worried about their children using social media. And uh, the effect of addiction to, to technology and uh, that gives me the feeling that we should do more at Net Kitabi. So we move people from addiction to negative addiction to technology to using it for the positive of society. I also have a radio show every Tuesday morning and I have Palestinian I call innovationalists who come up with ideas in the streams of science and technology. And there came occasions when we went to the studio with one story, we came out with different stories and wanted to always build on them. The common factor amongst them is that they want to produce, is that they want to do good work. <coughs> and I recall a story of a little boy who came to me and he said the following, and I would love to share it with you because I was so moved by the story that I took it to my friends and I wanted to do something about it. He said, I have been lucky to be sent to NASA as a little boy. And he said, you know, I was really astonished at the level of uh, money that's gone into this NASA. So I asked one official, I said, how much does the Americans, how much does the society pay for running NASA here? And he said, uh, the guy answered him, $17 billion. And then uh, he says, uh, he looks at me and he says, you know, NASA, cost the American people $17 billion. 
we in the Arab world burn half a trillion dollars uh, cigarettes. I wanted to ask you, how many NASAs could we have built in Palestine if we saved on cigarettes? <laughs> if a 12-year-old boy is telling you this story, what would you say to him? Sorry, I'm defeated. You go and find the way you, to build your NASA. You can't but be inspired and feel, you know, you have to do more and more. And I get people who say to me, you know, I went to university. Who was at the comedy session by show of hands, if you don't mind? Yeah. I went to university and like any Middle Eastern family, you win the status of being a doctor and a, an engineer. You win this, you know, triumphant social status in society. So I interviewed this guy. <laughs> he said to me, I finished my degree. I became a doctor. So I satisfied society and I kept my parents happy. In a few months' time, I'm going back to university. I have done the something they wanted, and now I want to go and do the something I want to do. And with that energy, people have, with the energy that I saw in Gaza 10 days ago, you cannot be defeated. You cannot stop. You cannot be submitting to the fact that occupation is there and that Palestinians will never prevail. I assure you, with the talents you saw, with the people you saw in the, in the movie, we will always prevail. We will always prevail because we are human beings and we love to see as to how we can contribute to humanity's advancement of knowledge, knowledge productivity. So the e-bread that the man asked me about in Gaza can yet turn into e-government, e-medicine, e-learning, and every e you can imagine. So the e-world should prevail. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, these have been three inspiring um, stories, three inspiring journeys um, by each one of you. We'd love to open it up to the audience. Um, I have some more questions if you don't, but if someone does, uh, please raise your hand, but also wait for the microphone. So this woman in the front, and if you can introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi, I'm Nancy Ward with the World Justice Project. And I have a question for the mayor, and that would be to ask you a bit about the role of collaboration in the success of your initiatives. You spoke, I think, a bit about your um, going to the mayor of Medellin and also the mayor of Bogota, perhaps. And um, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about uh, the, the sort of the power or the utility of, uh, as a social innovator, of having partners along with you in, in that process. Yes, as I mentioned, we were the first one to have the homicide rate for, for any Colombian city. And when they said that it was because we had the Cali cartel, we said, well, it's fine, it might well be. But let's check. Uh, I checked the data from Medellin. It was three times as high. And so Bogota was higher. So the, the important component I remember very vividly was that at that time, most people in Colombia thought that nothing could be done. And the, we have the guerrilla saying it's poverty and we would keep being a violent country because, because of the uh, poverty. And so the, the Catholic bishops also say it was poverty. So uh, because of that, we, we were paralyzed. The important thing was that we began by using this simple method, which was absolutely neutral because it, w it didn't have any political connotation, just restrict all those things. The, the, the we began to, to build the basis, and then we went to the IDB, the three cities, not the, not the country, the central government, they still have not noticed that there was a big problem. And we got uh, the loan from, from the IDB for, for violence prevention, which at that time was a major accomplishment inside the bank. They never thought, they were, keen to finance education, infrastructure, whatever, but never, they never thought that the, this would be a, a subject uh, that merit their, their, their support, until we showed them that in the case of Colombia, 15% of the GMP was lost because of violence. Then they say, okay, it, it must be a very important thing. So, so it's interesting that data, whether it's the um, 25 million uh, years of productive service yes, or that, um, the statistic you just used, 
or, or, or the NASAs. How many NASAs could we have built if we didn't, if we uh, uh, bought that rather than stop smoking? So very, very interesting use of these uh, kind of metrics. So the girl accounting, it's, it's all the same. I mean, the theme comes up that says if we can start putting this in, in words and in ways that people relate to, uh, it matters. Have we got another but question? Yeah? Just a comment. Uh, I remember the, the discussing with a Mexican friend that worked at the World yeah. Bank. He was a physician, public health like me, and say, well, how come with this frightening homicide rates, they don't care, the bank people do not, do not care. And then he said, because they don't understand homicide rates. The only language they understand is GMPEs. Huh. So we began the strategy to convert mm -hmm. into the cost. Yeah. cost. We did s some seminars on the cost of violence, and then all the economists began to say direct cost, indirect cost, and all these things. When we had that case, then they grabbed it. They yeah. It was our fault. We were not talking their language. So, so when we began to talk their language, they immediately grabbed it. Yes, right here. I'm Jens Molbach. I'm from Seattle with Win Win. I'm really enjoying hearing the personal stories from all three of you. Um, and I have a question that's slightly different, but I'm intrigued because all of you have worked both in government and outside of government. And on the topic of innovation, I just postulate that government and public sector is generally not known as being a fountain of innovation. And I'm curious what you've seen both in your roles in the public sector and the private sector, what's different about trying to be innovative in the public sector? Is it simply a matter of scale and size that makes it more challenging? Is it cultural? What is, if it is different, um, what's it like being a part of the system as opposed to being in the private sector? So why don't we start with you, Diana, and the other two can chime in if you. I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I can say, uh, and I'm, I mean, our, our focus of our work um, at the ICAI uh, Commission <coughs> is, is focusing on what DFID is doing with UK international development expenditure. DFID has a good reputation for taking risks. Um, in, compar in comparison with other uh, aid agencies and donors, um, it's recognized by its peer group as being good at taking risks. Um, uh, and quite frankly, I mean, it was quite a significant risk to, um, uh, for, for the then Secretary of State to create a, an entirely independent body to publish and scrutinize what they were doing. That's quite, that is quite high risk. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't get any sense of there being um, a, 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 a lack of a, a willingness to take risks. I think that they do need to be better at risk management, and I think they need to be better at communicating, the both internally and externally, that this is this is an area where it is risky. You know, you can't say that you're going to wave a magic wand over development in in Somalia or, or South Sudan, by way of example. Um, um, so, I, and I think that I think that that then has an impact on their. Um, on, on the willingness of the, of the um, uh, country office heads to take the kind of risk. So it becomes rather dependent on how brave those individuals are, and I guess also how much influence they have in the organization at large as to whether people will say good for them for doing that, even though it, even though it went yeah. wrong. Could you all follow up? Well, I was just curious. That Governor instruction, the fact that you're independent gives you the ability to take more risks um, yourself or your group. But that doesn't answer the question about the people who set you up in the beginning and making you independent, which so when I say is an innovative notion. Well, I, I wouldn't say that that, that I, I don't we don't take risks as such. I mean our remit is to review the eleven billion pounds a year and we've done reports on any number of subjects, including uh, aid uh, uh, to Palestine. Um, uh, um, so, um, and in order to choose what we're going to look at, we do analysis, we do public consultation, we consult all the relevant stakeholders, uh, we then publicly announce what our work plan is going to be, um, and we base what we do on evidence. Um, and, and so, I mean, our job, and I mean, my job for 30 years has been as an investigatory uh, and litigation lawyer understands what presenting evidence means and challenge to evidence in court and, and, and so on. So 
um, and, and indeed in the criminal court. Um, uh, so I, I don't see us as taking risks, uh, but we are challenging in a way that the, the, the sector uh, isn't used to uh, because of how transparent it is, how, how well published it is, um, the amount of media attention it gets. Um, and, uh, and, and because certainly I, I mean, I've, I've now been working in international development for seven years, but it's nothing compared to my 30 years of experience in the law, um, uh, I, I am an outsider. Now, that's a great strength because I'm, I am independent and I've got all this body of background of skills of finding the truth and, and testing and analyzing the ed evidence and weighing it up and then writing it up. But, you know, I'm not from inside the sector and right? there are people in the, in the sector who find um, someone coming in from outside challenging. So it does, I mean, it feels quite but risky in reputational terms. Um, but I'm very confident of the strength of the work that we're doing. Coming from the private sector, um, taking risk is something which is, I mean, I'm a lawyer, so lawyers, I guess, don't take risks. Um, but our clients most certainly take risks, and I've dealt with a lot of people who take a lot of risks. And um, they do it because it gives them competitive edge. Can I just say that I lived in a flat when I studied at uh, university here. I lived in a flat that was owned by a, a lawyer. So he always wanted to remind me, don't forget the rent. You have to pay the rent. <laughs> so the best way he did it is that he had this big banner on the fridge that said, lawyers <laughs> never lose their appeal. <laughs> so, so even if you want to mess around, you still have to pay me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm worried sitting next to you. But can I answer the question, <laughs> yes, if you yes, don't mind? Please. I mean, you know, we have to face the music and be frank. There's always, uh, I would say, a hidden competition between the public and private sector, especially in the third world. If you listen to speeches by politicians, including myself, I would say, you know, we have to always complement each other. You know, the private sector does what it does. The public sector has to provide the policies, has to provide the laws, and has to provide the vision for the way forward. But to tell you the truth, it is all down to leadership. Mm. If there is leadership that believes in the talent of people, if leadership that believes in this complementary effect, it will happen. If there's a leadership that believes in, in itself, in, in, in the machine, in the public sector machine, in its entirety, and believes that can do it all, and know it all, and believe in it all, nothing will happen. And on the question of aid, if you allow me, and you're a lawyer, don't sue me after what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever DFID or others give money, there is always political strings attached. Like, you know, somebody said today that we love democracy, we advocate democracy, we ask the Palestinians to have their elections. But we accept the process, but don't like the results. So we stop the money and we close the taps. Yet we go to other countries in the Middle East and we massage their ego, we never question their democracy, and we sell them weapons. So there is hypocrisy also in the level of aid in terms of this political strings. So I think we, you guys, or people who are giving aid, have to understand that those who are receiving uh, aid are not idiots. And that we are not blindfolded into, we are seduced to the fact that we need money and we need to survive. But that's my message to my fellow friends from the third world. Sustainability is a big issue, is a big banner that we carry. I've been to endless of meetings where the word sustainability was there. But then you ask as to how much of it was enacted, it's very minute. So I guess the public sector and the private sector, if they believe in ideas, they can make them happen. And if they make them happen, they have to understand it's for the good of the people. Mm. Now, it is hard to compare public-private sector in the West vis-a-vis public-private sector in, I would say, countries that are developing and are yet to develop. Don't forget there's failed states as well. So it's a combination of every effort that needs to be mounted, and it is the combination of expertise. Like, 
in Palestine when we wanted to launch the digital campaign, we couldn't have done without the private sector. And we couldn't have done without universities. And we couldn't have done without civil society. So it's the consolidated o effort of all sectors. I, I just yes. have one uh, part of the answer. I have worked my, most of my life with private foundation in the slums of Cali. Yeah. That's why I was easily elected twice. Uh, but I, I see clearly the advantages of the private sector, the social private sector, which is a non-profit, because they can afford to develop a model for time, years, some, sometimes, evaluate the model, which something in the public sector, sector you hardly can do. You cannot wait five years to see if that training of micro entrepreneurs is the adequate, if it works, it will be out. So, but then if you take that model, develop, it will be uh, increasingly uh, successful. I can tell you, I work in this foundation learning to help people to build their houses. So we sat to see where were the difficulties, the prices of the materials. They were prime iron, bricks, cement, three or four times the market price. So we, we set up huge housewares where people, these people could buy directly from the producers at market yeah. prices. So we individualize all the difficulties. We, once we have that model, we helped. I used to go to my foundation every year and say, look, we have helped uh, 150, 200 families to solve their problem. And we say, oh, it's very nice, we're very, very happy. I was measured the first time using that model. I built 38,000 houses in two and a half years. So the model was there, S simply, well, if, if, but I could not have developed the model in the public sector, I took it. So I, I, I would like to see, it's yeah. a matter of a scale, but it's more than, more than scale. Yeah, that's great. We have time for one more question, uh, right there. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Tarun Varma, originally from India. I'm a double master student here. I'm interested in education and then scaling it up uh, while I do my MBA next year. So it was beautiful to hear uh, hope in Palestine with Neth Kitabi. I think you know education is, is the biggest leveler. Um, my question is slightly broad, which and I'm curious about the inflection point where things become very popular, you know, across uh, or, or, or change becomes popular, and it's broad because. Diana mentioned that 17% hasn't budged for 25 years, uh, but you were able to um, bring violence down. And, uh, you know, uh, Net Kitab is just starting out, but it, there'll be a point where adoption can increase. So, in those specific trajectories, can you plan for an inflection point? Because you brought up Nandan Nilekani's example of saying, hey, let's do a pilot for 100 million. Or is it outside forces that enable uh, the tap becoming a flood? And you know, as a, as a leader, do you, do you wait plan for, for that inflection point, or, or do, do you just you wait till it happens? Right? Yeah. Okay. Let Anybody me tell you about an inflection point that we introduced about two weeks ago. And as I was here, I was either grilled or praised for such an endeavor, an adventure in Net Kitabi. We said we will do the following: we will run a campaign saying goodbye my school bag. I know for sure all mothers would adore us because all school bags. We, we never ask ourselves as to why kids have to drag hmm. such heavy weights mm -hmm. to school and come back. And I ask my kids, do you read them? Do you read all these books? Do you need them all? Yes, the teacher had said so. And this irony of the teacher demanding you have to just abide by. So we ran a school without a school bag to society that was going be far too uh, advanced and beyond traditions. Some did not like it. Some attacked us saying, you know, you're breaking some taboos here. The book is very important. You cannot do it. But others have appreciated the point. And I think we'll be doing more of this because we have received, at large, I would say, support from community. I have put it on my Facebook. I received tens of thousands of uh, hits. And I saw the comments I got from society. So I guess this will be an inflection point whereby we will uh, introduce something new to schools, replacing school bags and tradition with technology. And as I say, we believe in blended learning. We don't say goodbye books. 
but we say let's complement the books mm -hmm. with, the, with the digital age. Second inflection point, and I will give the chance to my colleagues, was that we realized that 82% of our kids love technology, but not all of them are capable of buying the latest devices you guys have. Yet they want to go to internet and they want to uh, post their own uh, comments and feelings and reflections on what goes on in society and join social media. So we thought let's open up what we call knowledge, digital knowledge shops. And we asked society if we can have a shop in a highly uh, populated area, downtown. And now in Ramallah on the 26th of April, we'll, uh, we'll open the first one. And then we got uh, university graduates who have worked on recycled furniture. Uh, so we got tires in, turned them into chairs. We got crates of vegetables and, uh, and, uh, and fruits, turned them into tables. And we got the spools of cables for telecommunications to turn into a table in, the, in that center. And now we will open this. Now, when we sent out the invitation, I thought, you know, we will not get any... Takers. Any, and those who have sponsored us have done it with, with a reserved approach to it. Because we wanted in that uh, shop to get kids to come free of charge, to use internet and use computers. And now, as we speak, my phone is not stopping. I'm getting confirmations from the private sector saying we will happily come. And it's creating a vibe. And all are the big gurus of the private sector. If I win them, forget about the billions you hear in the world that we're giving Palestine billions of dollars in aid. Hardly ever, they hardly ever come. If I, win, if I have 10 billion, I assure you, invested in, te in technology and education, you will see a different Palestine at least. I don't guarantee you the Middle East, but you will see a totally different Palestine. Would anybody else like to comment on that? And that is, do you just, uh, is there something you do to hit that or plan for that inflection point? Or um, is it just that you have to wait till the moment in which the stars are aligned? I, I, I'd like to, to say on this, uh, on the issue of, of, of women, um, which is a subject I feel very strongly about, and I have four daughters, so I guess I have an extra personal interest as well. Um, I was in the Unleashing um, Girl, Girls Power this morning, which was a very powerful session. I don't know if anyone else was, it was in there. Um, and people were saying that the moment is now um, to, do, to do something about this. Um, and uh, Jeff Skoll raised the question, so you know, if it is now, what can be done in the next year to actually tip that, turn that inflection point into something that will take off? And I, and I, 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 I want to say on, on the, the, the point you raise about this 17% of women in, in of partners in, in my old firm, um, we, I think in the UK, we've lost that edge, so far as women are concerned. There was a kind of sense, there was a big shift in the, in the 80s and 90s, and then somehow we've done that, and we most certainly haven't. And I have to say that if we can't get women into senior positions in this country, where every opportunity, they have every opportunity. We're all educated to pieces, you know, we all have, you know, I have a voice, big loud voice, but are we making enough difference? And if we can't do that here, how on earth are those girls in, in, in you know, uh, in, in, in really, really, really difficult parts of the world to do it? And I worry that the, the world of international development can have a whoosh of excitement on a topic, and then, you know, before you know it, could have moved on to something else and thought something else is the new thing. It's, it, to me, there are inflection points, but you, you cannot be complacent that somehow, because there's a lot of noise about it. And I was in the session yesterday on conflict, power, and religion, and terrorism. And afterwards, there was a group of women when we were saying, you know, none of us raised the really big elephant in the room. And I spoke to Gemma, the chair, afterwards, and I said, you know, none, nobody in the room, and it was a terribly good session, raised the issue of this is a phenomenon <laughs> of violence against women all around the world. Here in Oxford, adolescent girls have been groomed by teams of men 
um, and, and, and sexually abused for years, and the police turned blind eye on it all. And look at what's happened with Boko Haram and in Nigeria and ISIS in Syria, all around the world. There's a phenomenon of real evil attack on, on women. It's like it's the way to undermine a society and destroy the progress and hope and optimism that is otherwise there, there to be. And we have to do something about it. And I said to Gemma, why did nobody mention it? And she said, five women after that session, all powerful <coughs> vocal women, had been up to her and made this point. And she quite rightly said, why didn't you raise it? And I thought, why didn't I raise it? And I feel that, that women can be our worst enemy in all of this. Um, you know, even I didn't raise, get this issue out, out on the table, and that's why I'm doing it now. Um, <laughs> and, but I feel, I feel that th there's an issue here, and partly it is that women, and we're expecting t adolescent girls to sort of do this by themselves. We're expecting women to do it by themselves. We have got to get a grip and bring men into this. It's, I think it's really important. So I see inflection points, and I see them come and, and go, and, and I, my answer to your question is, you've got to get these momentums to keep going on and on and on and somehow find the vigor and internal um, oomph to, to stick with it. So with that, I'd actually um, hope that all of you have uh, um, garnered as much wisdom um, from these very three courageous people. I think from our friend in uh, Palestine, uh, there's much we will all take away. But I think um, the power um, and the need to restart again and again is something as social innovators um, we need to remember and honor uh, even in the darkest days. Um, from Diana, I think it was that we have to be who we are, um, but I think you added uh, something at the end, which is we have to seize that moment. Mm -hmm. We have to um, create that momentum. And uh, for uh, uh, Mayor Guerrero, we, I think, uh, see the power of science and evidence to, uh, uh, to approach for breakthrough results, that uh, it was just absolutely stunning to see those kinds of numbers in that type of time frame, just breathtaking. So I hope you'll join me in thanking this amazing panel.